Hey guys, it's been a little bit since I've updated, maybe, and I figured I'd let you guys know what's been going on. Gail has taken me under his wing and is showing me his secrets to surviving in here. He's a good teacher, and I'm learning some tricks for navigating the DGBs. It's hard to explain it all, but I'm going to try my best. A lot of it's mental preparation and association, which is really hard to teach, but Gail's a pretty good teacher, and... I'm starting to get the hang of it. The first lesson was how the DGBs work. All the Dollar Generals are like spokes on a big tire. They all move forward, never backward. You can't go back simply by going through the door. Wherever you entered from is your first spoke on the wheel. That's why everyone's journey starts in a different place. My first spoke is different from yours, and my last spoke will be different from yours too. There are nearly infinite Dollar Generals. At least I've never seen one repeat itself by going through the door. I'm sure there must be an end to them, but I'm not sure I want to see what it looks like any more than you do. You with me so far? I nodded, but thinking about it made my head hurt a little bit. Traveling the spokes, the stores, is easy. You just go through the door. Navigating the stores, that's a little harder. The way I did it was to think of the stores as spokes on a wheel, but a wheel needs a hub. This store is my hub. It's the middle point where I come to get out of the wheel. Technically, I guess it's a spoke too, but thinking of it as a hub helps ground myself. You get it? I, uh, I waffled a little, not wanting to admit it was a little over my head. Kinda? Kale laughed. Don't worry, you'll pick it up. It's like riding a bike. Once you do it, it's easy. In that, he wasn't wrong. Lesson number two was traveling with people. So if you're traveling with other people, you have to be touching them for the two of you to travel together. Here, put a hand on my shoulder, he said, as he prepared to step through the door. I slid a hand on his shoulder, and we stepped through together into a similar store. This one, however, was KK, the place I'd found Gale's bulletin board. See, that's how we came out into my Dollar General, when we left the miasma behind. I had a hand on your back, so we could travel together. That made sense, and we proceeded with Lesson 3, traveling to a specific place. You've done yourself a favor by leaving marks behind. At first, I was popping around to stores I remembered, like the ones with the weird letters or the ones with the strange things in them. But once I started leaving my own markings, I could travel to specific places. Pick out one of the stores you've been to before, and let's go there. He put a hand on my shoulder, and when I walked through the door, we came out in LL instead of GG, the store with the Mother's Day decorations. I was a little disappointed, but Gail patted my shoulder reassuringly. It's tricky took me a while to figure it out, too. Let's try again. Picture the marks you left. Close your eyes. Get a good middle picture. And then step through the door. I tried again, really focusing on the twin G's. But when I stepped through this time, it was to find myself in an older location. The one with a single G on the floor. When I told him I'd goofed again, however, he told me it was progress. You're getting the hang of it. Going to G when you were thinking about GG is pretty damn close. Just keep practicing. You'll get it. We spent a while just traveling from one store to the next. Sometimes I got close. Sometimes I just moved forward. But after a while, I started to travel to the right destination sometimes. It was something that took a lot of focus. And when I put my hand to my head and told him I was getting a headache, Gail suggested that we take a little break. Have a rest. Drink some water or some Gatorade or maybe some coffee. Just kind of take it easy for a bit. It isn't something you get right away. It takes practice, and even I sometimes get it wrong after all this time. I can't say how long we were at it, but for what must have been a few days, we worked on pinpointing my navigation to the stores that I had been to already. I saw a lot of familiar places. Though Gale refused to go to the meat market store, as he called it. He said that he'd encountered shadows there. 
shadows that thought he might be for sale, and he had barely escaped with his life. I figured I must have gone while they were closed, and counted myself lucky. After a while, I could travel pretty well between stores without too much trouble, and when Gale was pretty confident that I had the process down, he suggested we move on to something else. Lesson four involved bringing other things with you to other stores. So your clothes travel with you because you don't think about them coming with you. It's like your nose or your hands. They're parts of you, and, and your mind just assumes that they'll make the trip. Now, I want you to take a good look at yourself and visualize what you look like in your clothes. Once you have it committed to memory, then you can add things to it and take them with you. He made me practice in front of a full-length mirror, inspecting myself and committing my clothes to memory. The clothes weren't hard. I had worked at the same place for years and was very aware of what my uniform looked like. No, the hard part was adding to it. I found the most colorful backpack in the store, but committing it to memory was difficult. If it wasn't just right, then it wouldn't come with me, and Gail assured me that the backpack was all I needed to get right. Once you get the backpack down, everything you zip inside is inside. You don't really have to remember it, because it's inside the bag, and you know it's inside the bag. Once you have the bag down, the rest is cake. That one took a while and gave me some headaches. Sometimes the bag wouldn't come with me. Sometimes the bag would, but I would concentrate so hard on the bag that I wouldn't travel where I wanted to go. Sometimes I'd load it up with stuff and find that the bag stayed in the place where I had been, and not where I'd went to. Gail told me to be diligent, and after a while, it all came together. I couldn't say how long that was, but it had to be about a month. We went about my training the same way I had gone about traveling. When I was tired, I slept. When I was hungry, I ate, and when I had to go, I went. Gail had an answer for solid waste, too, and it made me laugh when he explained it. The place with the burnt roof is where I take all my crap to. I figure if it's where that thing moves around the most, he's welcome to it. We went there when we had a bunch of it, Gail putting it in hefty bags and sealing it in his backpack. He tossed it into the gaping ceiling and ran, the two of us coming back to the DGB Zero like kids after a prank. Gail said he always waited till he had a whole bag to throw it out, and he hoped the creep liked the little present. Gail and I became good friends, but I think it was more than that for him. Sometimes, when he clapped me on the shoulder, there was an almost parental gleam in his eye. We ate together, we slept near each other, we talked a lot, we became close quickly. He talked about his travels, the things that he had seen and more than 20 years that he'd been moving through the Dollar Generals, but eventually we landed on a topic that I was hoping he knew something about. How far in have you been? I asked one night, as we were cooking marshmallows over a propane burner. Gail thought about it as he slid the mess between graham crackers and chocolate. I've marked up to 218, I think. Do you... I thought about my question a little more as I chewed over my own s'more. Do you think anyone's made it out? I said, slurping a little as the treat stuck to my mouth. I don't know, he said. If they did, I, I don't suppose we'd know. Not unless they left notes. I nodded, taking a sip of lukewarm cola to clear the roof of my mouth. Surely the store can't go on forever. There has to be an end. Gail shrugged. I suppose wouldn't make sense for them to go on that long. I almost hope there isn't, though. If there is an end, then there's only so much food, water, and supplies. We'll eventually starve to death here, and that's a bleak prospect. We went to bed not long after, but I never stopped thinking about the infinite loop of perfectly odd Dollar General stores. What would be at the end if there was one? Would it be an exit? Would there be a creature living there? Was the end what lay outside or in the ceiling? I had no answer, so I drifted off, thinking about the possibilities as the fluorescence hummed overhead. Gail and I started exploring more after that, 
and I think he was looking for other people to add to our group. We could go see if the hermit wants to join our band, I asked, and Gail laughed bitterly as he pointed to his stomach. <laughs> Maybe give him a chance to finish what he started, too. I wasn't surprised to hear that the hermit had been the one to stab him, but I did wonder why he never traveled. We never saw him while we were out getting things, and we avoided his little corner like the plague. FF was strictly off limits, and now I realized I had gotten off very lucky in our exchange. I don't know how long I spent with Gale, but it felt like years. I know I say that a lot, but it's hard to convey how strange time is on this side. Time is something I'm used to counting, used to hoarding like a dragon, but here it isn't something I have to think about. What's more, I don't know if anyone is even getting these updates. If they are, how quickly or slowly are they getting them? Are they coming in daily? Weekly? Are you waiting years between messages? Are your children seeing them and having vague memories of something their parents told them when they were small? Are all the Dollar General beyond or otherwise stones beneath the foundation of some other store? Does the name mean anything to those who may or may not be reading it? I don't know. I write these updates because it feels right. I write them because I feel like I should. I've gotten pretty good at traveling now. I can travel back and forth, carry supplies, hold things in my hand and travel, change my clothes and bring them back with me. And it makes me proud and a little afraid. With two of us, Gail and I have used some of the dolly loaders to move shelves around in our hub. We're opening up the floor plan, and now we have all this space for activities. I know, cheesy, but it's a classic. I've started keeping a journal of the different Dollar General Beyonds, so I can remember which ones are which. Here's a few of my favorites. Store FF, designation Dangerous. Food, none. People won. The theme is destroyed. It's the home of the crazy hermit. Beware this store. The shelves are bare of food. The hermit has hoarded it all somewhere safe. Could be secrets here, but they're hard to find. Store JJJ. Designation dangerous. Food minimal. People none. Theme is waste disposal. Where we drop our waste. A fire took out most of the store a long time ago. The food here is all non-perishable and it's stacked up in the back. Known location where the miasma come out. Store T. Designation low to moderate dangerous. Food, plentiful but strange. People, none. Shadow creatures a possibility. Theme, strange human meat market. This is the place that may contain shadow creatures. The shells contain what appears to be human meat, and the store smells like coppery plastic. My research partner claims to have been accosted by these creatures, so proceed with caution. Stuff like that. I'm working on a more complete study of them, now that I can take my notes and things with me without putting them on my phone, which will run out of space eventually, and I'm hoping to make a complete study of the DGBs. That's all for now. I'll shoot you an update when I have more. Sitting here writing this out, listening to Gail snore, it's nice to have someone to talk to and just be with. I hope it's something that will last. Hey everyone, hope you're still reading these, or even seeing them. It's been an interesting little journey so far, and I thought it might be past time for an update. Gail and I have been traversing the stores, getting supplies, and mapping the different setups, and I've seen more stores in the short time I've been with Gail than I have in all the time I was on my own. I've seen places where the shelves are made of smoke. I've seen places where the ceiling and the floor are reversed. I've even seen some stores I think might be on another planet. The languages vary in many of them, and some of them aren't even dialects I think are native to Earth. I've made some notes on them, and I hope to write them down for you a little later, but for now, I have to tell you about something that led me to think we might not be the only ones who can travel through intent. 
We had gone back to KK, practicing my movements, and I was getting ready to go to another one when Gail stopped me. Something is wrong, he said. He was looking around as if he expected to see something obvious, but the answer wasn't quite that simple. The store wasn't what you would call in any kind of order, and it reminded me of the store that I had trashed. Shells were moved, things were tossed around, and the mess was everywhere. Gale could talk about not wrecking the stores, but it appeared he had done just that on his own. As such, it took us a couple of minutes to notice that the sign in the window was missing. Someone had taken it down and torn it in half. Gale looked at the pieces in confusion, not sure what to make of it, but looked to the break room as if the culprit might still be there. They weren't, but they had left their handiwork behind. They had ripped the bulletin board down and smashed it on the floor. Gale stared at it as if someone had desecrated a grave, and I could see him trembling in barely contained rage. Who's done this? He whispered, his voice full of pain. Who's torn up my board? He picked it up, checking over the ruined front as I started looking for clues. There wasn't much to go off, but I did find a couple of things that the perpetrator had left behind. There were scraps of clothes that had gotten caught in the door when whoever it was had left. There were shoe prints on the wall under the spot where the board had been, the tread visible as if it had stepped in something gross. The last tied it all together, and the smell of it made me gag a little when it hit me. Someone had taken a dump in the floor near the manager's desk and then trod through it on their way out. Friggin' animals, I said, covering my nose as I took a step back. I bumped into Gale, and he seemed to have seen it too. He took the bulletin board back with him, but the damage was definitely done. I asked him if he had any idea who could have done this, but he didn't seem to have an answer. He sat looking at his little memorial, the cork board, the only reminder of his friends, and I wondered if he was going to be okay. Someone, or something, had gone in and wrecked his remembrance plaque. I say something because as far as I knew, we were the only people that could travel with any accuracy. If there were others, then why hadn't they found us yet? Or we them? I sat with him for a little while, hoping he would snap out of it, but after some time, I decided to leave him with his thoughts. I decided to go and find something to cheer him up, a nice meal or something sweet, and Hopefully, he'd be back to his old self. I was heading to WW, a very special place that I discovered before meeting Gale, but didn't entirely understand. When I first came to it, the floor didn't feel right, and the whole place smelled like food. When something dripped onto me as I stood studying it, I immediately went through again and stepped into XX. I told Gale about it after we met, and he laughed and offered to take me back. When he showed me the true nature of the place, I understood what a cool store I had run from. Here, I'll show you my journal entry, and maybe it'll shed some light on the situation. WW, Sweet Store. Designation, Low to No Danger. People, None. Theme, Dessert Shop. WW is a store made entirely of dessert items. The shelves are made of chocolate, the floors are made of marzipan, and the ceiling drips with endless whipped cream. Everything there is edible. All the packages, the products, even the walls and the furniture are fit for consumption. It's a great place to find a sweet treat. Pretty cool, right? There really is a store for everyone. I closed my eyes and prepared to step through, wanting to grab something sweet, but as I came into the place, I thought I'd made a mistake. I still stepped into the wrong Dollar General about 20% of the time. I'm far from perfect, but... As the overwhelming smell of chocolate assaulted my nostrils, I realized I'd gone to the right place after all. The walls, the shelves, the floor, they were all still made of confection, but their composition had changed drastically. Most of the shelves lay in chocolate shambles. The packages that were uneaten had been scattered and stomped on, their contents spread across the floor. The packages left smears across the ground, and the smears were worked deep into the marzipan. The ceiling was untouched, but it was a little bit out of reach. The mess was impressive, like some wild animal might do when cornered and trying to escape. 
I started looking for the source of all this destruction. It seemed similar somehow, like a place I'd seen before, and I felt the hairs prickle on my neck as I went. I found a candy cane, of all things, lying by the base of a shelf, and held it firmly between my hands as I went deeper into the store. As I rounded an aisle, I saw something scuttle out of sight. As my foot came down in an extra thick splat of whipped cream, I heard the skitter of something that ran along on all fours. I kept checking my peripherals, listening for the subtle scrape of feet, and when something finally lunged at me, I brought the hooked end of the candy bludgeon around and cracked the end on the face of my attacker. I brandished the broken tip, ready to fight whatever had come for me, but it was the last thing I expected to find sprawled on the floor. It was him. It was the hermit. He was writing himself, getting up on his hands and knees and hissing at me like a wild animal. His grimy clothes were smeared with chocolate, and his hands were caked with the store's leavings. He seemed more feral than he had the last time I'd seen him, and when he threatened to lunge again, I shoved the broken end of the candy cane at him, and he scampered back smartly. Get back, I yelled, and for a wonder, he did. He ran for the bathroom and plunged through the door, leaving the store in disarray and leaving me with questions. I traveled to XX, following on his heels, but he was nowhere to be found. There was no way he could travel like Gail and I could, but I suppose that would explain how we had gone to Gail's old store and messed up his board. It seemed impossible. The guy was crazy, but the more I thought about it, the more it seemed like it had to be him. Who else could it be? We'd encountered no one besides the hermit, and if it wasn't him, then the prospects seemed even more fearful. I went back to DGB Zero to give Gail the bad news and found him seated at the desk we'd put together and fixing his sign. I ran into the hermit, I told him, when he didn't look up. What the hell were you doing in FF in the first place, he asked, putting down his tape and glancing over his shoulder. I wasn't in FF, I said, hesitating a little as he looked up in confusion. I was in WW. He's made a real mess of it. Gale sat back, and I could see that he had recreated the board as it had been when I'd first seen it. The warnings, the stories, the pages of remembrance to his old friends. They had all been lovingly recreated, and it did my heart good to see it restored. It deserved to be here. It was important to Gale, and we should protect it. That doesn't make sense, Gale said. He's never shown any inclination after leaving before. He's always stayed in FF for as long as I've known him. Are you sure about that, I asked? When I showed up, there wasn't a lot of food left, and there's no way he's been living there all this time without a food source. Gail shrugged. I never thought about it like that. Mostly I just avoided FF because that's, that's where I've always encountered him. I guess he must be traveling. But how does he know how to get back? is what I want to know. It's not impossible, but he's about half crazy. You can't tell me that guy could figure out how to travel with any real destination. I don't know, I said. How long has he been here anyway? Gale scratched his head, looking like he was trying to puzzle out something difficult. He was the first person I encountered when I set out traveling and I'd been traveling for quite some time when I met him. I don't know if he was here before me, but I suspect that he might have been. I guess maybe he wasn't always crazy, but that's just speculation. any rate, if he's wrecking up stores, we need to stop him. Like I told you once, there's no proof that the store or the resources they hold are infinite. If we're going to survive here, then we need to stop him from making that harder. What's the plan, then, I asked. But that's where today's story ends. Gail and I are creating a plan to stop the old guy from wrecking up the stores, but it's something we have to approach carefully. He's crazy and dangerous, and if we don't want to get hurt or killed, then we can't go in half-cocked. 
Gale has started keeping a closer eye on the Dollar General, and we've started going into other stores with weapons. If he attacks us, we'll be ready. Hopefully, we can take him alive. As promised, though, here's a couple of excerpts from my store journal. Hope you guys enjoy them. AA, the Upside Down Store. Designation, Low Danger. People, None. Theme, Upside Down. This store is like a regular store, only, well, upside down. The shelves stay on the ceiling, and the food doesn't fall off them and come up, so there must be some sort of weird gravity. Gravity doesn't seem to have reversed for us, however, so we walk on the ceiling and find all the shelves unreachable. Gale, however, suggested using a stepladder, and it's possible to reach high enough to pick some of the items down to us. The place makes me dizzy if I spend too much time there, and it's a real trip. S. The Street Store. Designation Moderate. People. Shadow Drivers. Theme. Street Fair. S. Is a perfectly normal street, with booths set up that have items. It's all inside, but... The ground is concrete, and there's garbage cans and street lamps and graffiti in odd areas. The only real danger present is that sometimes cars drive up and down the road. They don't go very fast, and they're not hard to get out of the way of, but if they hit you, it could kill you or hurt you. The shadow people who drive them look like living shadows, and they don't get out, so there aren't any troubles there. As long as you stay off the center of the street, then you should be fine. The food is normal, but aside from the shelves, there are these odd little food stalls that just seem to have cooked food in them. You shout what you want into the stall, and they cook it, and you can watch it be made all by itself. It's wild, but a nice little change-up from the norm. The stalls have a finite amount of resources, but if they run out of food, they'll put up a closed sign. There are eight streets, and they have sidewalks beside the shelves. The cars don't seem to come from anywhere in particular, and don't seem to go anywhere either. The exit is a tunnel with a crossbar blocking it. I've talked to Gale about going into the tunnel and see what's on the other side, but he is staunchly against it. We spent some time making plans, but very little was decided on. The hermit had to be dealt with. That much was clear, but it was the how that eluded us. We could take him alive, but then we'd have to guard him. We could kill him, but neither of us were sure that we could kill somebody. He had to be stopped, but how could we do it? First thing we gotta do is find him, Gale said. If he can travel, then he might be anywhere. We need to track him down and see where he is. If he's going back, then FF would be a good place to start. True, if nothing else, we might find out more about him. What's to know? He's a crazy old dude, I said, adding a length of rope to my bag. If we were going to find his lair, then there was a good chance that we could set a trap for him. True, but was he always? I don't know how long this old guy's lived in the Dollar General Beyond. He could have come here when they were still called J.L. Turner and Sons. Hell, crazy dude could be Cal Turner, for all I know. Who? I asked, not having a clue what he was talking about. Sorry, I don't know why I would have expected you to know the store's history. Cal Turner took over after his father died and officially named the store Dollar General after that. Word was that he went missing sometime after opening the first one, just stepped into one of his own stores and was never seen again. His son ran them when I worked here, but I suppose he'd be an old man by now. Cal and Carl, his son, looked a lot alike, and it took the company years to admit that the owner was gone. Some people say that he just became a recluse, but I know managers who were close to the family, and they swore that the rumors were true. Anyway, I doubt the old man is Cal. He'd be older than hell and likely twice as crazy. I didn't like to think about another lost soul trapped here, but it did make me wonder how many others were taken prisoner by this place. I had no clue how long I had been there, but I knew it hadn't been very long compared to Gale, and Gale believed the old man had been here longer than that. If people didn't age, then who's to say Cal Turner wasn't here somewhere? 
Who's to say there might not be any number of people traversing the infinite, or not-so-infinite, Dollar Generals? And if there were, why hadn't we met any of them? Have you ever met anybody else? I asked him, before I could think better of it. Sad to you, Gail said, smiling a little at the thought of it. No one other than the hermit and Celine, I guess. He got a little speculative then. Thinking about his friends always made him quiet and thoughtful, and I hated that. Gail was a good dude, and I didn't think he should be inundated with guilt over people he had no control over. He'd done his best, plain and simple, and they had done what people do. I just thought of something, I asked suddenly as I slid a cold brew coffee into my backpack. If he's going through the doors, then shouldn't he stop being crazy? Gail cocked his head at me. What do you mean? Well, you said that all injuries and damage to clothes and stuff are fixed when you go through the doors again. If he's rattled from his time here, then shouldn't he be kind of, I don't know, reset or something when he goes through the door? Gale pulled his bottom lip into his mouth, chewing on it as he thought the question over. The doors had always healed anything that was wrong with us in the past. Whether it was a wound or ripped clothes, it always fixed us, and we were pretty reliant on it for clothes and general fixes. If the crazy hermit was able to travel while remaining in his wrong mind, then maybe the doors didn't reset you as much as we thought. Hell, Rudd, I don't know. Maybe he's messed up enough in the head that he thinks that's just how it is. Certain amount of what we do with the doors happens in our heads. I don't claim to understand all of it. Sometimes it works different for different people. It works the way it works for you because that's how it works for me, and I'm the one who taught you. He may have learned differently, so it works differently for him, I guess. Maybe we can ask him if we manage to grab him. I nodded trying to ignore that he had called me Rudd again. Rudd, or Rudy, had been his son, and the more comfortable he got with me, the more often he slipped up. I do not mind, not really. If he thought of me as his son, then I was okay with that. No, it was Gail who seemed to mind. Even now, he had realized that he had said it, and his face had gotten stormy. I knew he was still looking for Rudy, still looking for all of them, but the chances of finding them seemed to dwindle the longer they stayed gone. Rudy had gone after another of Gail's original group, but it seemed that no one came back from the ceiling. I was already trapped in the Dollar General beyond. I wasn't in a big hurry to get trapped somewhere else. Got everything? Gail asked, pulling on his pack and taking up his club. We had never really carried weapons. Not like this, but after finding the hermit in other stores but his, we had started taking them with us. We had taken wooden chair legs and hammered nails into them. They weren't very sturdy. They were mostly spiked particle board, but they would do in a pinch. We had taken some of the hoodies off the rack and sewn cardboard into them. They weren't great, but they would do too. The cardboard wouldn't do a lot, but it was the best we could manage. Ready, I said making the chunky sweater as comfortable as I could before we set off. I wanted to start an FF, but Gail said that we should go check a few key places first. I have some safe houses I want to make sure he hasn't hit yet. It's nothing impressive, just some food and things that I've come across in my travels. I made notes as we went, and here's where we went from my journal. It's starting to come along, but I know it's a drop in the ocean and a long run. B. Normal fall store. Designation, low danger. People, zero. Theme, fall decor. B is a perfectly normal Dollar General that's been set up for fall. It's got pumpkins and scarecrows, and some of the Halloween decorations are there, but not all. It has some seasonal items, but it seems to be the start of the autumn selection, and doesn't contain as much as it would by the end of October. Gail had apparently been there before and left a go bag. He went to the manager's office and opened up the red box that usually held the fire extinguisher. Instead, there was a backpack that Gale took out and unzipped. He looked over the things inside, talking under his breath as he made sure it was all still okay. Alright, I didn't think he would come this far, but it was possible. Let's go to the next one. We did a quick check before leaving, but everything appeared to be in place. 
The things I had used were gone, but nothing else seemed to be taken or moved. We still weren't sure that he could take things with him, but as we moved on, we were in full data collection mode. OO, Night Store. Designation, Moderate Danger. People, Zero. Theme, A Dark Store with Lamps. OO is a shadowy place, and one of the few stores without the buzzing overhead lights. It's lit by tall metal street lamps, and the light they make doesn't go very far. It does not appear to have a ceiling. Any attempt to shine a light up there reveals nothing, and Gale thinks that it's likely it's here to simulate a night sky. Some of the shelves are pushed over, and I suspect that the miasma can come and go freely here. We've never encountered them here, but it seems likely that we could, so we try not to linger. Gale hit the ground running when we got to OO. None of us liked to be here, but he felt like it might be a good place to hide something because of the environment. The whole store was pitch black and lit by these interspaced lamp posts that cast yellow globes over the shelves. He reached between two shelves and took out a duffel bag, handing me the light as he went through it on the run. When he had established that everything was there, he zipped it up and we headed out. There was a sound as we came to the door, something like the moaning wind from the shadowy ceiling, and we were through before we could discover what it was. Store Triple E, the cave store. Designation, highly dangerous. People, zero. Theme, a store inside a cave. Triple E is a store inside a cave, as the name entails. The lighting is glowing fungus that bathes everything in a mysterious glow. The shelves are carved into the stone, and some of the items are made of rock. In the middle of the store is a pool of water that's okay to drink from, but contains a monster. Gale says it's a big crocodile, and that it comes out to walk around on occasions. It chased us the last time we were there, and it's easily ten foot long. There are bats that hang from the ceiling, though Gale isn't sure what they eat since there are no bugs here. He's never seen them move either, so... No one is sure what they do as well. The food here is refrigerated by the cave, which is a consistent 65 degrees at all times, and nothing seems to spoil or go bad. We came into the cave looking for the creature who lived here. We had been here a few times. The store had a great selection of mushrooms, but the last time we had come face to face with the gator who lived here. I hadn't really believed Gale when he told me about it, but it was hard to deny it when you were face to face with the monster. He had a long snout like a crocodile, and his scales seemed to shift through a series of colors as he came hissing after us. He was slow, thankfully, and we got out before he could catch us, but I suppose that put my rule about no living creatures in the DGB into question. He was in his pool today, at least we assumed he was, and Gale pushed a rock aside as he took out another backpack that he had checked over. Most of these bags had things like first aid kits, non-perishable food, and toolkits that could be used to make traps and snares. Gale had set them up just in case he needed to secure another store or travel the infinite for a while, and I was sure that these weren't the only ones. Gale had been here long enough to set up safe houses in several stores, and the one in the DGB Zero was just the first in a long line, I was sure. Okay, Gale said, pushing the rock back into place. He hasn't found any of these. I can't think that he has any real skill with travel, but if we haven't come up on him, then he must have enough to go back and forth. Are we ready to check FF then? I asked, still feeling that it should have been our first destination. Not yet, Gale said. Let's check a few random places. If he's just traveling willy-nilly, then we might find him somewhere near FF. I nodded, seeing the logic, and... As we set off, we went to GG first. GG was the place I had stopped after my initial encounter with the oldster, and it was a store set up for Mother's Day shopping. The whole place smelled of flowers, and I really enjoyed coming here. It was nice, and the whole atmosphere seemed to glow a light pink. GG was fine, but as we moved into HH, we could tell that someone had been here. HH was a normal store, except for that all the words were reversed. It was like a weird mirror store, and looked like someone had ripped open a couple of the bags of chips and ate them right off the floor. They were scattered like a rat had been at them, and 
though we weren't absolutely sure it was him at first, we found more of his leavings down one of the aisles and decided that it was a good enough calling card for our little friend. We checked a few other stores. Some of them bore similar signs of visits. Food scattered, trash tossed around, and a nice healthy dump left nine times out of ten. Now are we ready to check FF? I asked, tired of looking at scat and stepping on chips. I suppose we should, Gail said, after finding his calling card in another store. Seems unlikely we'll just run up on him while he's being so sporadic. Gail seemed like he didn't really want to go to the hermit's lair, but it was our best bet of finding him at this point. We stepped into the dump without much fanfare, the hermit's store looking as desolate as ever. The floor crackled under our feet as the wrappers and garbage crunched underfoot. He had just been dropping his trash in the same manner that he dropped his waste, and the whole store stank with a mingling of rotten food and human crap. I didn't want to be here either, but we had to go make sure he wasn't hanging out and waiting for company. We stayed close, searching every shadowy nook and dirty cranny, but we couldn't find the old man hiding anywhere. Okay, it was a good idea, but I guess he's out. Come on, let's try somewhere else. We were leaving the back area, near the automotive section, when my foot struck something and I stumbled. I immediately wished that I had been looking where I was going as I fell face first into a pile of dirty rags, my nose coming into contact with the worst smell I had ever experienced. Imagine old sweat, unwashed clothes, dirty bathroom aroma, and a hobo camp on a hot day, and you're pretty close. I came staggering up, trying to get away from it as quick as I could, but when my hands fell on a plastic holder with what felt like paper in it, I reached back and pulled it out, too. It was a backpack, one shoulder strap ripped from the bag, and inside was a journal. It was old and cracked, the leather extremely abused by the owner's hands and many openings. The paper inside was curled at the corners, and there was a bookmark inside of a happy cat with a fish in his mouth. The handwriting inside was neat, a meticulous script that had been written with care, and I doubted that the crazy old man had done it. There was a lump in the middle of it, and I thought it might be a button or a name tag. It's, but I heard Gail grunt as something came screaming from the top of the nearby shelf. The old hermit had returned, and it appeared that we had found something he treasured. Gail turned to catch him, but he landed on him and knocked the wind out of him. The old man was off and capering towards me, his teeth bared and his face a mask of crazed rage. He rushed me like a linebacker, knocking me over as his long, dirty fingers closed around my neck. My air was instantly cut off, his nails digging into the back of my neck as he screamed and gibbered in his weird language. I tried to fight back, I tried to push him off, but he was solid for someone so old. Shoving at him was like shoving at a boulder, and he leaned into me as I slowly strangled. Black spots started appearing in my vision as his greasy fingers choked me to the point of unconsciousness. I wondered if the door would bring me back to life when he inevitably collapsed my windpipe. Would Gale be allowed to drag me back through it, or would this crazed loner simply bite my throat out and eat me right here? When his blood splattered my face, I supposed I'd never get to find out. As his fingers loosened, I could see Gale standing behind him, panting as he released the handle of his weapon. The nails were sticking out of the hermit's skull as he shook and gurgled, and when I slipped to the ground, his blood made dark stains on the blankets that he had used as a bed. Gale stepped away, shaking as badly as the old man had been, and when he ran for the door, I followed after him. When I came through into the DGB Zero, but he didn't. I knew something was wrong. Now I'm left here with just the journal for company, feeling like maybe we've crossed a line that neither of us were ready for. I'll keep you all posted, but for now, I think I need to go and think about what's happened today. Hey everyone, hope these are still coming through. My cell phone hasn't needed a charge in a while, and it seems to be stuck on 70%. It's a shame. One more and 
I definitely have grounds for some internet points. <laughs> it still displays weird times and dates, and no one has answered any of my messages or comments on any of these posts. At least on my end. Gail hasn't come back yet, but it's only been a little while since the thing with the hermit. No, that's, that's not right. It's only been a little while since we were forced to kill the old man who resides in FF. I've started reading his journal, but I know now that it isn't his. The journal belongs to someone named C, and I suspect that Gale will be very interested in seeing it when he gets back. I say this because I'm pretty sure that the writer is Celine. I'll write down a few of the entries and let you judge for yourself, but sounds like this person has gone farther than even Gale and I have. Day one. This is the first day I've started keeping this journal. I figured out how to take it with me, and I'm experimenting to see if I can take other things with me as well. I had to find the gaudiest one I could find. Pretty sure it's got unicorns on it. So I could visualize it, and that seems to be the secret. I kind of accidentally stumbled across it when I was going through one of the doors with the candy bar in my hand. I could see myself eating it, and... When I stepped through, it came with me. I was halfway through the Snickers bar before it hit me that I still had it. Everything else I'd tried to take with me had been left behind, and I have a feeling this might be the start of something big. Day 2. I visited 12 new Dollar Generals today. It's weird, some of them have odd things in them, futuristic things that I've never even heard of. I found one that sold cigarettes today. Can you imagine a Dollar General that sells tobacco? The tobacco, however, turned out to be these weird vaporizers. It still gave me nicotine, but it was definitely a head rush. I hadn't had a smoke in... God, it's been a while. It was a nice treat. Day 5. I saw a store where everything was upside down today. Kind of made me feel dizzy. Day 7. I managed to take a backpack with me to a new store today. All the stuff inside disappeared for some reason, but the backpack came with me, as well as my journal, so that's a start. Day 8. I managed to take things with me to another store today. Normally it helps if you visualize all of it, but it's better if you just see the bag when you take them with you. No clue why, but it, it seems to work. I'll have to experiment with it some more. I had to go through seven stores before I got it to travel with me. Some of the stores are pretty weird, but the one thing missing from them are people. I haven't seen a single soul since I left Gale behind, and I wake up sometimes hoping to see him standing over me. I miss him. I miss the others. I miss the sound of people talking, laughing, just existing. The stores are much too quiet for my liking. When I read that, I had to go back and read it again. Once I read the name Gale, I... Knew this had to be his lost friend. If she was alive, though, then how had the old hermit gotten her journal? Given the reception I had always gotten, it was unlikely that she had been welcomed warmly. Had he killed her? Were her bones part of the garbage that littered the store? I had to read more. Day 10. I saw weird shadows today when I went through the door. They were walking around this weird store and... There were stalls of meat just sitting around. The meat looked pretty weird, and when one of the shadows grabbed me, I pulled free and made a run for it. I suspect the bins had human meat in them. Day 11. Came upon a dark store lit by lamps. I didn't like it, so I didn't stay long. Made me think of the thing that took Margot, and I wonder if it lives here. That entry sort of sealed it for me, and... I skimmed ahead a little to see if I could find some new place. Day 19. Found a weird store with a burnt-out ceiling near the door. Whole place seems weird. I don't like anywhere with an exposed ceiling. I moved on quickly, and the next one surprised me. It was underwater. I came out swimming, and though I panicked a little, I didn't drown. I swam around, seeing a few fish, but I saw something big as I got near the back, and made my way out. I expected I would have to dry off when I came through, but 
My clothes and my things were dry when I came out in a Christmas-themed store. Day 20. Still in the Christmas-themed store, but I've been thinking about trying to travel backwards. There has to be a way to go back, doesn't there? Gale hasn't caught up. Maybe he never left, and I don't know how long I've been traveling. Days? Weeks? Maybe years? Who knows? Doesn't seem to matter. Time's weird here, and I can't really tell how long I've been here. My wristwatch just blinks, 8888, and when I go to another store, it always appears on my arm when I take it off. Maybe I'll experiment a little and see if I can go back the way I came. Day 30. After 10 days of trial and error, I finally did it. I was picturing this store I went to once, the store made out of candy and sweets, and when I walked through, I was there. I was so happy that I jumped for joy. Now I just have to make it back to my original store so I can see what happened to Gale. I hope he's still alive. Day 45. No matter how hard I try, I can't seem to go back. I've been trying for days, well, for periods of sleep, and it's no good. The store was kind of unremarkable, and I can't seem to get a good picture of it in my mind. I have to keep trying. I have to keep picturing it. I I know I can do it. I know I can make it. I have to go back. I have to find him. There were a lot of entries after that. The writer, Celine, either went forward through the loop or went back to similar DGBs. She was steadfast in her efforts, wanting to see Gail again, but the more she tried, the more discouraged she got. She started writing about how it might be impossible to go back to the place you started at. She began to wonder if there was an end to the stores. Slowly, she lost track of time. The days stopped mattering. The days ran together, and her contemplations began to pile up. She mused a lot, perfected her traveling, and eventually, she was rewarded. Today. I did it! I went back to the first store! I remembered this in cap we had made, Meet the Team, where we had posted things about ourselves. It was just pictures and stories and little personal blurbs, but it gave me something to focus on, and I was suddenly standing in the old store. I used to hate when the flash of Margot's instant camera would catch me off guard, but when I saw that board with all the pictures and stories on it, I started to cry. We had hoped that someone would find it if anything happened to us, but it looks like I'd used it to find my way back home. I expected to see Gale sitting there, but he wasn't. I figured he would look up and tell me I had just left and ask why I'd come back so soon. Instead, he was gone. I did see his sign, however. I went to the break room and found his memorial for us. He thinks I'm lost, just like Rudy and Kenneth and Margot. But now, I'm looking for him. I have to find him. The stores can't be that numerous. There has to be an end, and if anyone has found it, I'm sure it's Gale. He'll be looking for it, or for me, as we speak, and I have to find him so I can team up with him and help find the end. I felt myself tear up a little as I read it. She had done it. She'd come back to where it all started. If she was looking, though... How had she never found Gale? The stores were numerous, but they had to have crossed paths at some point. I began to wonder how long Gale had been gone, and I worried that he might not be coming back at all. Then, I would be alone too. I looked back down, flipping through the next few pages as Celine sat waiting to see if Gale would come back. I knew he hadn't, but it was interesting to see his travel from a different point of view. Celine eventually left too, but she left him a note on his bulletin board so that he would know that she was looking for him. That struck me as odd, because Gail had never mentioned seeing a sign of her. When he talked about Celine, it was always in the past tense. He didn't expect to find her, and if he had ever found any sign of her, he had kept it to himself. What else could he have been keeping to himself, I wondered. I flipped through a few more pages before landing on something that seemed interesting. Today, 
I have officially been to every store between the start and the Christmas store, and I haven't found Gale. I've seen signs of Gale, but I haven't found him. I've decided to press on. These stores can't go on forever, and maybe if I find the end, I'll find Gale. It's worth a shot, isn't it? Today, I've seen so many stores, I've lost count. Time means nothing anymore. I've started carrying more food, however, when I find it, because not all the stores have actual food. I went to a store on my travels that was nothing but plastic food on the shelves. There was another with rotten food in the packages. Some of them just sell the same items, duplicated a thousand times. Some of them don't sell anything. They're just empty shelves and awful music. There, there's no end in sight, but I'm not giving up. Today, 30 stores today, nothing edible. Today, I was attacked by bats in a large cave. I made it out, but just barely. Today, I found a store where the products were made of people, and the people made of food shopped there. I'm not ashamed to say that I ate a few of them when they tried to corner me. I hadn't actually eaten in three or four stops, and my supplies are all but gone. One of them was made of popcorn, and his blood was cola. Another was made of celery, and he bled ranch dressing. After I bit and savaged a few of them, they moved, but I was still hungry. I ate four and a half of them before I left. I've got an arm made out of prosciutto in my bag, and it's oozing Swiss cheese. Hopefully, it'll keep me going. Today, I saw some weird letters on the ground. They told me I was in XX. I don't know what that means, but the store looked like a little Japanese village, and you could get food there. It was like a theme park, kind of, and there was a bathhouse where I took my first bath in a very long time. I ate and ate and ate and until I thought I would burst, and then I soaked and slept, and when it was finally time to go again, I was rested and refreshed. Today, I saw a dog today. He didn't appear to be in distress, but it was odd to see him. He followed me through the door for a bit, whining for pets and seeming happy to see me, but eventually when I lay down to go to sleep, he left and went his own way. Poor thing can only move forward. What a frightening prospect. Today, I've gone back to my original store. I'm not sure where I went, but if it's the end, then I don't want to go any further. I stood looking into the bathroom door, something I've done a thousand times before, but on the other side was something different. The store I was in was a winter wonderland, complete with snow, but the other side was pitch black. Things were moving in there, and the longer I looked, the more I realized that they were large, but far away. I don't, I don't know what that was or what they were, but I couldn't bring myself to walk through that door. I started crying, suddenly just wanting to be home, and when I stepped through, I found myself back right where I started. It should have been demoralizing, should have been something that would completely destroy me, but it didn't, probably because I know that I can go back to that door anytime I want to, probably because I know it'll be there when I'm ready, and I think, I think that's the worst part of all. I'm going to stay here for a while and consider what to do next. I hope Gale finds me, but I have long ago given up hope of finding him. C. That was the last entry, and I had no idea how long ago it had been. Beyond that page, stuff between the next two like a bookmark, was a plastic name badge with Celine's name on it and faded, pressed-on letters. Gale still hasn't returned, and I'm starting to get worried. For that matter, how long have I been sitting here reading? I wanted him to see this. I want him to know that his friend is still out there. I can't imagine what's keeping him, but I have a bad feeling about it. What if he doesn't come back? What if killing the hermit pushed him over the edge somehow? What if he blames me? 
I don't know what to do, but as I sit here writing, I feel my eyes getting heavy. It's been a long, well, not day, but it's been long enough. I'll update soon. Till then, take care of yourselves. I woke up to find that Gale still hadn't come back. Well, I guess that's not entirely true. He came back, but he left me a note. I woke up to a rumbling belly and a full bladder. After taking care of my various needs, I came back to the sleeping area with a waffle sandwich and a cup of OJ. If you've never made one of these before, they're pretty easy to make. Take two waffles, mine are plain, but you do you, and cook bacon, eggs, cheese, and whatever spices you're going to use, then put it on a waffle. Add syrup or whatever. I added blackberry jam and consume. It's pretty tasty. I sat the orange juice down before I noticed the note. I slid it out from under the juice and saw that it was from Gale. His handwriting's pretty distinct, and I munched on the sandwich as I read the note. I found my appetite. I found my appetite leaving pretty quick, though. I'd expected him to say that he needed some time, that he was sorry for what he had done and how he was ashamed of killing the man. I didn't think he really had anything to be sorry for personally, but people accept things in their own way. If Gail needed some time, then I sure as hell wasn't going to get in his way. I'd sit here and wait for him, and when he came back, I'd show him the journal from Celine, and everything would be good again. He'd be excited, and we'd strike out to find her, and then we'd find a way out of these stores and back to reality. What I read, however, was closer to a Dear John letter. Gail was leaving, and he might not come back. This is hard for me, but I need some space. I've been intending to leave for a little while now, but I feel you need to know why. I know you've recognized the slips when I talk to you, and... As much as I'd like to use you as a replacement for my son, that's not fair to either of us. You just remind me so much of him, and it hurts me sometimes to be around you. It makes me miss him. It makes my soul hurt. It makes me realize that I've been scared to really go looking for him. So that's what I'm doing. I'm going to go look for Rudy, or what's left of him. I'm going into the ceiling. I'm going back to where it all began for me. And I'm going to find him. Don't, don't come in after me. And please don't blame yourself. This is something I should have done the day after he went into the ceiling. And I'm a coward for waiting this long. I don't want to gloss over what happened with the old man. Because that was a big part of this decision. When he jumped on me, I was squished and lost my breath. As I lay there trying to get my bearings, I looked up and... For half a second, it was like watching him choke Rudy. I could see his face, your face, as it turned purple. His eyes, your eyes, bulging out. And I acted in a blind rage. I've... I've never killed another living person. Never even really been in a fight, but killing that old man makes me feel bad. He was protecting himself as much as I was protecting you, and I just can't get over what I did. I went back after I'd calmed down and wrapped him in his flimsy blankets before setting it on fire and giving him a proper send-off. I tried dragging him through the door, but he was still dead. You can add that to your rules, I guess. Dead stays dead. There's no changing that. I laid him to rest, though, and doused him in enough lighter fluid to set out the store on fire. His trash burned with him, so maybe give FF a little while before you go back. Though I can't think of any reason why you would. Keep traveling. Keep learning. Keep searching. Find a way out of here. If I can come back, I will. For better or worse, I'm gonna see my son. Good luck to you, Alphabet Man. Good luck to you, my friend. Gale. I read it until the tears falling out of my eyes smeared the words. I threw the remains of my sandwich towards the back of the store. It had turned to ash in my mouth. Gale was gone. For better or worse, he was gone. And I was alone. I reached for the journal, wanting to throw it into the store as well, but 
couldn't bring myself to do it. It was precious knowledge, and it might help me find someone else who was trapped here. If Celine was still here somewhere, then I owed it to Gale to find her and try to help her out. It's what, it's what he would have wanted, after all. So I packed up some things, the journal being among them, but when I picked up the bag that the journal had been in, I felt something else in the front pocket. It turned out to be a second journal, this one older and held together with rubber bands. The spine had disintegrated, and it was just paper held between a cover at this point. It smelled foul, and I supposed it had belonged to the old hermit. He had likely stuck it in here for safekeeping, and I wondered if Celine's journal had been how we learned to travel through the stores. I didn't really want to sit down for long enough to read right now, so I tucked it away and decided I'd come back to it later. I went back to KK first, hoping Gale might have lost his nerve, but not expecting that he would have. I saw the familiar store, the chaos of the moved items and tossed aside merchandise, and it was hard to miss the open ladder in the middle of the floor. Gale had made good on his promise, it seemed, and now he had gone into whatever lay above. Whether or not I'd ever see him again, I didn't know, but... I left a message on the door just in case. If he came back, I wanted him to know where to find me. Gail, meet me at the hub if you get this. Celine, you don't know me, but I'm friends with Gail. If you see this, stay here, and I'll come back sometimes to check. I have your journal, so if you see me, I'm a friend. Not sure what else to do. I started traveling again. I had no clue where I was going. But I knew that I wanted to make notes on all the places I could see. I wanted to make a complete folio of the stores, a guide to find particular places, and I knew that I'd have to explore to make that happen. It made me feel like a pioneer, charting a map for those who might come after me, though I wondered how they would ever get it. Would someone find it on my corpse one day, stuffed in a tattered old bag that had laid somewhere for a long time? Who knew, but it was something to do, and I was up for the task. I went back to the start, the destroyed remains of my first store, and made my way back from there. I had kind of flown through them on my first trip, taking in little and just plunging in for the sake of moving. I wrote down everything, made notes on all the stores I visited, and committed as much as I could to my phone for backup. I'm probably going to post more complete documents at some point, but for now, I'll probably leave it to little snippets. The stores are pretty creative, and not all of them are uninhabited, as I've mentioned. Not by people, though I've noticed things or spirits or something in some of these places. Here, I'll tell you about a few of the stores I've seen in my travels, since otherwise this might be a little dull for an update. D. Designation, low danger. People, zero. Food, plentiful, but weird. Theme, a Dollar General store, where pets are people, and people are pets. D is a perfectly normal store, but the roles of human and pet are reversed. The tags on the clothes, the models on the products, the advertisements, they all feature anthropomorphic animals. The pet food cans feature naked people looking at the camera at a lost and confused way. I've never seen any of the residents of this place, and I hope not to. The food here is edible, but it tastes like pet food. There's a lot of chicken and fish on the shelves, and all the cereal appears to be kibble. E. Designation, moderate to high danger. People, zero. Food, limited but present. Theme, the floor is lava store. E. Has a floor that is made partially of lava. Some of it is normal floor, but you'll turn a corner and suddenly, bam, there's a river of lava. The music here is just the sound of lava flow, and it's stiflingly hot. The shelves contain food, but the lava flow will change directions sometimes, and it's dangerous to stay here for too long. The floor seems immune to the lava flow, and it's fine once the lava goes away. The food here is mostly spicy stuff, but 
It is edible. The walls of the store are made of rock, and it's like being in an active volcano. I haven't been brave enough to touch the lava to make sure it's hot, but it will burn other things. When I tossed a journal into the flow, it devoured it, and it wasn't on the floor when it left. F. Designation, low to moderate danger. People, four to five creatures. Theme, the TV store. F is one of the stores with inhabitants. The beings who live here are dressed as normal Dollar General employees, but their heads are TVs. They mostly ignore you, but if you tap on them and they turn around to look at you, their faces are all staticky, so it's hard to tell if they're looking at you or not, but it's like you can feel their eyes on you sometimes. The weird thing is that all the food is in the TVs. The shelves are full of old-fashioned TV sets, and the food comes in the form of commercials. When you see the food you want, you reach into the TV set and take it. Sometimes it's fully cooked, sometimes it's frozen, but it's always real food. It's like that in every department, too. I pulled an entire futon out of one of them the other day, and I suspect that Gale had been using this one to stock up his safe house. Unlike the other stores, the TVs always seem to have products on hand, so they don't run out, if you don't mind being patient. That's just a few of the stores I explored today, but they really do seem to be infinite. It's lonely now, traveling by myself, but I've been trying to leave behind signs in case Celine is still wandering around. I've been using the break rooms like Gail did and letting her know where I've been and what I've seen. I make trips back to KK a lot to look for Gale, but he hasn't shown up yet. I climbed the ladder the other day, just climbed to the top and stood there, staring into the darkness. If I were braver, I would have gone in after him. If I was braver, the last message might have been my last update. I stayed for a while, just thinking about what I was going to do. I had the infinite to explore, a huge number of stores to see and catalog, but it all seemed so pointless to me. It's like the cell phones we carry. They can access a nearly infinite amount of knowledge, but thinking about it is kind of a lot. We use it to watch videos of cats or argue with each other, because the idea of accessing the infinite knowledge there is outside our understanding. We don't like to think about the infinite. It's too big. It defies our understanding, so we scrape away at it rather than just dive in. I could go anywhere, do anything, but my brain was telling me to sit and wait while it tried to understand all my options. That's why I was sitting in KK, laying on the front counter, actually, when the last thing I expected to happen happened. The front doors slid open. It was sudden and nearly silent. I almost missed it, honestly, but it was the slight squeal of hinges at the end that turned my head. The door was open, the outside nothing but grainy darkness that seemed to move as I watched it. There was a lamp post out there, the only light to be seen, and the longer I looked at it, the more I knew why the moths had circled them. It was beautiful, almost too much to resist, and as I lay there looking at it, I wondered why I was resisting. Why did I have to stay here? This place was just more of the same. But the outside, the outside was something new. What wonders might I find out there? It's still open, inviting me outside while I write this. I put some food in my bag, some water, and a few other things. I'm preparing to go outside. I don't know if I'll be back again. I don't know if my phone will work out there, but if I can, I will. Maybe I'll find Gail out there. Maybe I'll even find Kenneth. Who knows? Till next time.